A good book can transport you into an alternate time and dimension where the reader lives inside the author's imagination. But how do you write a book like that? Let's ask artist, researcher, and science fiction author J. Diane Dotson how she does it and see what we can learn. Diane, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yay! And we've got Corey Gilliam and Jack B. already in. Hello, gentlemen. Welcome, nice to welcome. see you. And if anyone has questions, feel free to spout them in the chat and we'll try and reach them as things come up. Um, so, like, world building, you know, in my mind, I, you know, immediately I'm just like, ooh, the mountains and the cities and the things. But, you know, what, in your opinion, do authors really mean by world building? A world building is, is exactly what it implies. You're building a world, but it doesn't need to be genre specific. And basically what you need to do is establish a place, a setting for your characters that feels lived in. It feels real. You feel like you're there and it is your stage for the characters. And it can be another planet or it can be an intimate little town in the middle of nowhere, as long as you make it rich with detail and put the characters in there and it's building an ecology. Hmm. Like ecology, it's the study of how animals and plants and people interact with the environment. Well, you're doing that when you're doing world building. You're creating this whole universe of interaction. And it's important because you have to set a time and a place and a mood and the smells and everything and challenge your characters. Like how are they going to exist in this world and how are they hmm. gonna react to where they're at? So that's world building to me. That I, I completely agree with that. There was one edit that I can immediately think of on the spot where the character like walked across this plane to get to another character. And I'm like, okay, but they're like sort of in this desert forest thing. Like, are there rocks tumbling under his feet? Is it crunching? Right. Are there leaves falling around him? You know, what's the air smell like? And so he really thought about that as far as the character and it totally transformed just this one little walking bit. And I was just like, yes, now I'm sitting in here walking with him with these rocks and dust. And it was exactly. like glorious. So there's kind of like two levels of world building. The first level is yeah. as you as the author, when you're kind of coming up with your universe and coming up with your society and the environment and the politics and everything. And then there's another level when the readers having the reader experience reading the book for the first time from page one, right. uh, as the prose uh, opens up, flowers, evolves, whatever, as the reader goes through the prose, they're starting to figure out what the world is like and the world is populating itself in their imagination. So two completely different processes. Right. And Interesting. so, yeah, you're, you're coming at it from sensory of the character and you're coming at it as literally the backdrop. So it's a complex situation, you know, of being sort of the stage designer and the director at the same time, if you're going to, you know, look at a play, for example. But in this case, you're having to be incredibly immersive because it's all words that people are reading or hearing. And so in that regard, you know, having a simple backdrop versus complex doesn't matter as long as you're getting the characters and the readers interwoven together in this place they find themselves in. So bringing, that actually segues into the next question. Um, this idea of complex versus simple. So are there like different types of world building? So I know when um, like us as editors are like, you need to build out your world a little bit more or people talk about world building and people just kind of get like the, you know, deer in headlights look like, <laughs> where do I begin? Um, so yeah, different types. Right, so, you know, the this, this simple, you know, you come up with a place where the main event is, is not the place, it's, it's what's happening there. And the small town aspect comes to mind. When you think of it, for example, Stephen King has it in this town called Derry, which is kind of an unremarkable town, but you have to make it relatable. And in that regard, it's remarkable because of what happens there to everyone in it. And so that's like a simplistic view of what's the town's history and what are certain places in the town that evoke a mood. Then you have this complex kind of world building like Lord of the Rings mm. or Dune or even Star Trek, Star Wars, where you're, you're building an entire galaxy or an entire continent or set of continents where it's this grand scope. And so then you have to bring, kind of dial it back down and then it becomes about, well, how does, how does that environment affect the characters and what they're doing and how do you make it believable and 
a lot of that has to do with putting down some rules, mm. especially in fantasy that you need to stick to. So, you know, you know where the character is, what, what other creatures and characters are around that go in that setting. So you write science fiction and with your worlds, you're kind of starting from scratch with the imagination. Like you don't have to set it in, in our world. The tech doesn't have to be recognizable. The creatures don't have to be recognizable. Um, so when you're, and, and you're wrapping up a series and you're going to start a new series soon. So if you were going to start a new series, um, how would you begin to figure out what this new world's gonna be like? What kind of rules would you use to um, hang your imagination on and build up this world? Well, I will say that I also have some fantasy in my science fiction in this particular series. So I'm kind of borrowing a little bit of both. And, and for the new series that I have going ahead, one of them is a true fantasy, but it's a dark children's fantasy. And then another story I have is like a campy horror that is set in our world. And then a third one is, is in our world, but at a tiny scale. So, you know, it's all depending on where do I want to be? You know, like, where do I want to put myself? Like I, when I was a kid and I was beginning to write, because I've written since, you know, I was young, since I was a child. And I wanted places that I felt like I could escape to you know, whether they were fabulous or scary, because I think we all like that sort of sense of like, ooh, you know, a sort of Halloween aspect of the, of the setting where we, we like to be a little spooked. And so I just basically would come up with a place that I wanted to go to. If it didn't exist, I made it. You know, if I wanted something beautiful, then I wrote it. And if I wanted something scary, I wrote that too and put my characters through a lot of chaos to, to travel through it. But later in life, what I have done a lot with my world building is because I have a background in ecology, in college and a degree in it, is I've, and, and I've taken a lot of trips as an adult across the country. I sort of borrowed and plucked from here and there from zoology and ecology and made a more realistic backdrop. So they're, they're fantastical, but they're based in some kind of reality in which there is that ecology again that I spoke of earlier, but in this case, it's really truly about the science and how do things interact and what kind of plants are there and what kind of animals are there, and what eats what and, and how, are, how are the people and the aliens that we get to know and the robots, you know, how are they interacting with that environment? So that starts to shape my world views, worlds and their views from now on. And I just feel like anytime you're trying to build a world, you have to dig in and research you know, the real world, we can't rule it out because it's, you have to make it believable to us, human reader, you know, even if the settings are wildly alien and mm -hmm. the creatures and the characters are completely inhuman. I, yeah, there in uh, one of my series, I, I really wanted blue trees because I had this like reoccurring dream with this gorgeous freaking blue tree and yeah. Um, so I have that. It's like the whole forest is just these blue trees. It's like, instead of green trees, they're blue. And I had a reader and she's like, so is the ground made of ochre or, or yeah, ochre? And I'm like, I, what? And she's like, well, you know, in order for like the bluegrass, the, there's a lot of red ochre found, you know, on earth where there's a lot of, you know, like bluish type plants. And I'm like, it totally just like blew up that part of the world for me. I'm just like, yes, right. yes, it does. It does have a lot of red <laughs> ochre. So, yeah, so you can definitely jump into that and play with that. Doesn't mean you have to completely make that a thing. Like you would have to have that kind of earth, but it's definitely something that if there's a scientific angle to it, you can play with that so much the better. Mm. And so how um, do you start to, or oh, sorry, go ahead, Kim. Uh, I was just gonna say, um, when you're when you're talking about the scope of like the small town versus you know like the Star Wars giant um, world building, also really comes into mind like what is your story? Like are you are you doing this big grandiose story? Like how much universe right. or Earth do you really need? Like you could just keep it around one little lake in a cabin. Exactly. You don't have to go beyond any of that. So just because it's small, you know, it's can still be rich. Right, you know, and like and under under Derry, which is a small town, you have this extra dimensional monster who comes at whatever every twenty seven years in it, you know, and so it's like this plain town that any of us could have grown up in, and then you have this incredibly strange and horrific creature. But 
and how it's starting to infiltrate everybody's minds. So, you know, it's just amazing to think that you don't have to go very far to feel like you've traveled far. So that's that's one goal of world building too, is that you feel like you've, you've brought someone along on a journey, a mm -hmm. new story. So how do you start to organize all of those facts? Well, I don't As have you, a big system. I kind of, it's all in my head, you know, so yeah. I, yes, I basically, that's what I do. <laughs> Well, and then some, sometimes, like you, sometimes things come to me in dreams. And, you know, I, this uh, entire characters that I dreamed of decades ago, they're now part of my series, but also places such as Ariad's sky asteroid, you know, that he's harnessed and he's got his castle on. That was a dream. Gorgeous. Uh, I love thank that. You. So that's, uh, you know, in terms of organizing it, the main thing is to just keep track of your own rules that you're making for these worlds. Because, you know, people will smell when you've, you know, gone off and sort of had this deus ex machina situation where you're like, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> that's hokum. So you, you just stick to your rules. And that's really all I can say in terms of organizing because my style is kind of different. I don't do, I don't have like this big table of things. I don't have, you know, a bulletin board of things like that. It's all up here. And I just get it out, just write it out. So, but just yeah, stick to the rules. That's the ultimate underlying fact there. All right, Crickets in the audience, he asked, do people you meet inspire characters you create? Oh, yes. There is a chef in Ephemeris, that second book in the Quest Rezan saga, named Sumand. And he's a perfect example. He's an alien, and he has multiple arms. Makes a great chef in that regard, because he's doing a lot of food prep, right? Well, so he was partly inspired by a chef I met in San Francisco in 1992. And that chef was an opera singer and really quite fabulous and outrageously hilarious and scandalously, savagely, just his wit would just slice you up into bits. You didn't want to be on his bad side, right? So, and I, that the guy stuck in my brain. And so when I was coming up with this place where I wanted Galadea, Gala, the character to go and go through the kitchen, she finds this chef. And this chef, Sumand, is based off of that chef's planned restaurant, Cafe Du Monde, which mm. would have been something that he wanted to do. So that was one example. And sometimes I'll give a nod with a name. There's a character in Heliopause, the first book named Troy. And that's in honor of a cousin of mine who was like an uncle named Troy. But most of the time, there is not ever one particular person that a character is based on. They're kind of an amalgam or they're completely out of my brain. Whole cloth. <laughs> So. Um, now, I read on your website that you do kind of fun things like making glossaries and you draw your characters. What yeah. are some outside of the box ways uh, that you kind of bring in your art and your researching background uh, into coming up, creating your book and creating your stories? Well, in terms of the art background, art grew with the writing. And so when I was a kid and I was writing these space operas that had girl leads, you know, whether they were human or alien. Uh, and you could you could tell that I liked Jim and the Holograms and She-Ra and, you know, and Tila and, and Evil Lynn and all those people. So back in the day, but I, the two grew together. And I started to draw fashions that I thought would fit in this outrageous environment, this intergalactic space opera. And so I came up with crazier and crazier fashions. I literally have hundreds of them in albums behind me from going back to the 80s and, and then on up. And then, so I liked to borrow the color and the richness. And there's a scene in Accretion, the third book, that I give a nod to the, to the galactic fashion. And wow. in that scene, they're in what, a palace in which the person who lives there is doing strange things to them. And they figure out this guy has some kind of ability. He's warping things a bit in their reality. And the guy is obsessed with fashion. So he outfits each person's room with things that would go with their personalities. And they go in their closet and they pick it out. It's kind of like a fairy tale. So And so I leaned into that design and, and art background and to kind of describe that whole scene and how those costumes looked in great detail. So that you, you could see them in your head, you know, and mm -hmm. you could feel them and, and want to wear them or not. In the case of the main character, she did not like that. <laughs> She was, she just wants to wear space jeans. But, you know, this guy was like, no, no, you have to look the part. You have to look like the, the commander 
you know, so it was fun. And then in terms of the science, like I, I like to add in, like I said before, the ecology aspects and the behavioral aspects of different creatures and, and people too. So that's going to be something in book four that will be extremely fun. I'll mm -hmm. draw on the more zoological side of my background and book four spends a lot of time on one particular world. And it is a very well fleshed out world because it was the first one I came up with. So it's been in my head over 30 years. And in this world, you will see a lot of animals and plants that, you know, require a glossary. Yeah. <laughs> Getting back to that. And I, at the time when I was a kid writing this and coming up with some of this, I didn't know enough science about it. I, I was very curious and I basically lived outside all the time. But I didn't know enough science to kind of have, you know, any significance to that until I had my degree in ecology and could kind of splice and dice. So it's just really fun to design from those different aspects of art and science this whole universe and everything going forward that I write to. Have any of those creatures that you came up with uh, ended up changing your story in some way? Actually, yes. There is a creature in book four that everybody's going to love so much and want in their lives. And I, I'm having, I'm actually commissioning a great UK artist to illustrate this creature. And I might, that might be my swag gift as Prince of that creature because it's going to be beautiful. And, and fun and charming. And this character, when I originally came up with it years ago, I, I thought, you know, this is a lot of fun. I like this, this creature's ability. But what I didn't realize was how close that creature would come to the main characters and how important mm -hmm. it is to have that kind of character slash creature in their lives. And that, you know, there's love and, and protection involved. And so that, that changed the story. And it changed the plot of, of a pivotal scene that is is heartbreaking you know and then there are a few other heartbreaking scenes and then too you get to care about this character so much that when the end game starts happening you're freaked out you're like oh no where where's it at you know where, what happened to it so yeah that was a plas classic example of this animal changes everybody's behavior around it you know it's like we gotta save that animal <laughs> forget my life i gotta rescue this thing you know so that was a really fun twist that that character decided to do. Yeah, I think everyone I like can this, relate to um, that. And I like I like how how world building it's more than just buildings and landscape. You know, you're talking about the details of of this one character and how he's dressing the, these other people, and that is really pivotal to like that particular character. How yeah. then the plot's building on itself going forward for these animals. And those are impacting the story and impacting the scenery um, and the world thusly. So I, I like that it's not just buildings and mountains, which right. I think a lot of people might um, get stuck on is the buildings and the mountains. It can be a lot more than that. Now, what, what's in the nooks and crannies between the mountains? Like what's, it, what's underneath the buildings? You know, what's along the sidewalks of the buildings if there are sidewalks, you know? So that's a fun way to sort of build that out is think about your setting and what little details and little fun things you can put in. And if you've, if you've traveled and you've been to other cities, think back to what you noticed that might seem mundane in your own town, but seemed extraordinary there, exotic there. Made you want to try it. Like what's in that little stall over there? What's that I smell? You know, I want to go find out what that is. And that happens in book four too, where it's in a city and there are mountains and there's you know, extraplanetary stuff going on, but the, the intimate scenes of just being like, what's that smell, whatever it is, I need it. You know, like the character's like, I need to go to wherever this yummy smelling thing is and find out what it is. It's little mm -hmm. human moments or, or alien moments where the alien wants to feel human in this case and is trying to just dive into that, you know. So as your characters are trying to dive into the scene and they're taking notice of the scene, you're bringing the reader along with you Right. And you're bringing the reader into the world. Um, are there other ways that you can uh, transport your reader, like as you you other ways that you as an author can transport your reader into your story without straying into info dumping? You know the right. That's body. always the challenge, right? You don't right. want to overdo it. And so I like to kind of ground things in in each of my books. I talk a lot about food, so I'm going to bring it up again uh, because I think that an energy source, because even Transformers have energon, right? So, you know, it's always fascinating to me, like what are people eating and drinking? Like in Heliopause, 
this guy had an obsession, Troy, with uh, making coffee out in this out at the edge of the solar system when he didn't have any access to coffee plants at the time. And so he had this terrible coffee that he would chase people down here, try it, like, God, please no. It's terrible, <laughs> stinks. You know, the main character Forster is like, I can't, thank you, I'm good. Uh, but, you know, and then another character will talk about how she'll make pie to make everybody feel better. In mm. ephemeris, there's, there's tarts being made. I think food actually is food and drink. You know, you think of Romulan ale, you think of Lemba's bread and things like that in these various genres that make you feel like, that's something I can relate to, you know, like I have to eat, they have to eat too. What are they eating? What are they drinking? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What's the texture like? You know, can they be sustained? And it like lemon spread, you know, and things like that. So that's one little thing I think is fun to do and a fun exercise is like, what's on the menu in your world? I love that you said that because uh, one of the books, Lauren broke, she was so worried that her characters were eating too much. It's like, they're always <laughs> eating. And I'm like, no, I'm like, it's good though. They need to eat and they're fun scenes. I've always got snack craving. So everybody should have like something that they really, really liked or really, really can't stand, you know, and you know, if it's bad coffee, if it's a great pie, you know, you know, make it, that makes you feel like you're there and you're like, yeah, I get it. You know, that's, that's how I would feel too. So that's a fun little thing. And it kind of breaks open the sort of mumbo jumbo, so to speak of like jargon and info dumping of like, well, you know, the statue had been around since the second age or, you know, whatever. And then that's great. And that's fascinating. And you need to establish that history, but how can you make it relatable? You know, like you can have a hobbit sitting in the base of some big statue frying bacon, relatable, mm -hmm. right? So it's trying to break up this momentous setting that you've made and you need to describe it, but you also need to bring it back down on the micro level and see mm -hmm. how it's directly affecting people. Like, are they cold in the shade of this enormous statue? You know, and do they feel the splash of something or the steam coming out of the vent of this very strange building that's, you know, 30 miles in the, at, you know, upper atmosphere, like what's happening there? Yeah. So if you can find a way that the scenery that your scene is set in right now can add tension to the moment, can add oh, yeah. just a tiny little bit of conflict to your characters, can put the pressure on them a little bit. Um, insert that detail, move on. Right. Um, but you don't need to write a whole giant paragraph about it. But that little detail can just be that little extra bit of tension that you need on the page, on that page, to make your scene come alive. Right, and a sense of urgency, weather mm -hmm. often will play into that, you know, like a, a swift oh, yeah. changing weather. They have to make a decision really quickly. You know, we need to get out of the snow the wind is driving, whatever, you know, and ch getting chilled and this person has a fever, you need to do something now. You know, so it's, it's just move the story forward with whatever is going on in the setting. Yeah, that, that we are reading, um, writing the breakout novel workbook. Oh, cool, yeah, yeah. Jonathan Mayberry, he suggested it last, yes. week, last week. He also, he suggested you come on the show to talk about setting last week. And now both things are happening. Um, anyway. Donald Moss, in his book, he says every page needs to have tension on it. And sometimes you're looking at your that page and you're like, I don't know where the tension is coming from. Maybe the setting is that little bit that can bring it right. in. Right. Or some, if it's not the setting itself, then it's, it's how the person's already reacting to it. Or maybe, you know, mm -hmm. like there's a scene where this one character is looking up at the cracks in the ceiling and they've been looking at that same crack for years and they're yeah. tired of looking at it and they want to move on and see something else, you know, like even little details like that, things that we would take for granted, but we could obsess over and just get honestly sick to death of that can sometimes help too. You know, it's not just about being transported. It's you wanting to you as the reader or the character that you're starting to really have this relationship with wanting to get out, you know, like Luke, you know, and Tatooine with, you know, his aunt and uncle, I'm sure he's sick to death of that place, right? There's nothing going on. He's a, it's just moisture evaporators. And he's like, I want to get out of here, you know, but like I would be obsessing over little things and just getting wretchedly bored of them. That's kind of me. <laughs> yeah, but the reader or the audience is watching that scene and they're like, you know, look at those caverns. Oh, I know. We haven't even seen right. the aliens yet. You know, we're excited. We're like looking at everything wide-eyed. Um, so the setting for the reader can have a completely different impact than the setting for the characters. Right. Now, speaking of that, earlier you said the word mood, mood and like tone. 
what is mood and how can an author use setting to create mood? Well, a lot of it could come down to lighting is always, you know, in art, in any kind of art, lighting is essential and, and creates a mood. And in our lives, we notice, right, that we are sensitive to daylight, you know, and the lack of it in winter and things like that. So I would say that lighting is something that you should definitely mention and it definitely is going to affect certain characters in a different way. And depending on the kind of character or creature, for example, that may be able to see things that another cannot, that's important. And so that can create tension as well, right? You think like Bilbo and Gollum, Gollum can see very well down in there and has the advantage over Bilbo. And they, things like that create kind of a mood where you're like, I would not want to be in this dark, dank space. So environmental controls, are part of that sound is also something there's this there's a really creepy sound in the enemy's lair in accretion it's like just repeating <sighs> over and over and over again and if you kept listening to it you would go crazy you know and so sound can affect mood and of course you know when you're watching a movie music is digging all the way into the mood right it's like taking right. taking it and running and you can't really do that on the page and so you have to create that with words alone and so any sort of if you can represent a sound that helps if you can represent lighting and if you can represent danger from the combination of those things that's always exciting because then that propels you as a reader but also you can you can project the light the light and joy this feeling of like you know the the sky breaking forth with whatever sunlight or moonlight and shining on the face of another character and and suddenly you feel like this moment of magic and, and love, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's all these different little things you can play around with in the environment of the world that you've built to shift it, you know? Just like you could with a picture that you're putting through a filter. You want it to look, you know, mysterious. You can lower things if you want it to be bright and open, then you brighten it up, things like that. You can do that with words. Yeah, you, you talked about that meant, um, reminded me of, um, another edit that I did. And this particular scene, it's um, like this great big character and he's doing his thing and then the little girl um, that he's protecting. And then they just have this moment of, of pretend, you know, she's the dragon slayer and he pretends to be the dragon, but it's sunset, but the sun setting and there's a light breeze. And it was just this like adorably cute moment and I loved it. But at the same time, because the sun's setting, I'm just like, this is going to be the last time. So then I was getting worried. I'm just like, oh, right. crap. Right. So it's like I really wanted this particular scene to just be, you know, really dig in on that adorable play because it's not going to last. Right. And so like in that sense that the sunset was, you know, even though it's gorgeous since it's beautiful moments, it's bringing a sense of doom. So right. yeah, and there's a scene in book four where the night before they feel all cozy and they're kind of becoming closer and they, they think, oh, this is interesting, you know, but I'm going to try to rest and we have a huge adventure tomorrow. And the next day, it, it's a bright day, but they both feel uneasy. There's something not right in the in, around them, even though it's daylight and they're out on this broad expanse, they both kind of feel on edge. And so trying to project that mood, you know, sort of a muted look to the sky that they couldn't quite see the sun, but it was light enough and it kind of affected the view of something they see in the distance, which starts to charge their way. So they've, you know, it's just these little moments that you have moments of intimacy that transform into moments of, ir of urgency and, and sometimes terror. So anytime you can do that is good. Hmm. I agree. Okay. And we wow. have a question in the chat real quick. Um, Jack B. Does Diane think she will go into as much world building in oh. future works? Hello, I lost you there for a minute. Oh, am I, am I back? Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. I okay, see so question. Jack, Jack B um, in the chat's wondering, um, will you go into as much world building in future works? Or does she look forward to a few projects that might be less intense, but just as rich in context? Jack, that's a great question. I think probably a mix of both. For, for the dark fantasy that I'm working on, the world building has to be pretty in depth. But in this particular case, I have to do a lot of actual scientific research for the background that's going on. And I, I want that to feel very real. And then 
the, the sort of campy horror uh, thing that I'm working on is more, I'm not gonna obsess too much about that because it's a modern setting. And while I'll, I'll frame everything around it, the world building won't be as crucial as the kind of extraordinary things that happen in the ordinary space, if that makes sense. So I've got a good mix coming, you know, and then there's the children's book that I wanna work on is, is gonna be looking at everyday things from a very different perspective and how's that going to look to that character in that setting? So I think a good mix is a good way to go. It challenges you as a writer. And I will definitely be doing more you know, sci-fi stuff and probably more hard sci-fi as well. So I, I kind of want to do all of it. You know, I, I don't have, a, there's nothing I want to keep off the table. I have horror, children's fantasy, dark fantasy, campy sci-fi, hard sci-fi, all in the pipeline. That is gorgeous. <laughs> All right, so before we move on to our next question, we're going to take a quick little spotlight break. And that one is Writing the Breakout Novel Workbook by Donald Moss. Make your novel stand out from the crowd. Noted literary agent and author Donald Moss has done it again. His previous book, Writing the Breakout Novel, offered novelists of all skill levels and genres insider advice on how to make their book rise above the competition and succeed in a crowded marketplace. Now, building on the success of its predecessor, writing the breakout yeah. novel workbook calls that advice into action. This powerful book presents the patented techniques and writing exercises from Moss's popular writing workshops to offer novelists first class instruction and practical guidance. You'll learn to develop and strengthen aspects of your prose with sections on building plot layers, creating inner conflict, strengthening voice and point of view, discovering and heightening larger than life character qualities, strengthening theme, and much more. Moss also carefully, carefully dissects examples from real life breakout novels. So you'll lean, learn how to read and analyze fiction like a writer with authoritative instruction and hands-on workbook exercises. Writing the breakout novel workbook is one of the most accessible novel writing guides available. Set your work in progress apart from the competition and write your own breakout novel today. Or doom! <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, Kaylee and I, we got really excited about this book last week. Uh, we've got a number of projects that we think it would be good to have some, like a creative writing instructor kind of help us to develop right. those ideas and kind of center our, our thinking. Um, but then it arrived in the mail. The thing is huge, and we're like, Let's get other people to feel our pain. And to do <laughs> if anyone wants to do this with us, um, we're we're embarking on it, and it's quite it's gonna uh, be a journey. It's gonna be a, yeah, it's gonna be a real journey. Exactly. I'm I'm really excited because I keep coming up with two big uh, world spaces. <laughs> it's like I already have one universe of five planets, and now I'm coming up with another one. So Ooh. maybe it'll help me keep the two worlds separate, so I don't clash too much. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We had a question, uh, two questions about that. Like, can world building get out of control, and how do? You, if so, how do you control that? Well, I think it can. I I won't name names. There are situations in which I felt like it's fabulous that you've thought about this and you've created all these details, just in minutia. You know that there comes a point where how is it driving the story? You know, and we need to get back to the story because it's going a bit off the rails and, and down the hill and over the veil and through the mountains and under a cave and all these other places that are really fabulously, beautifully written about that if the characters that you're, you've come to care about aren't in it and the story's not going forward, then it's time to recalibrate that. So, you know, I think it's, it's a balancing act, right? Because you want to feel like you're in this really unique setting. But if it's not driving the story, you know, it's time to cut the fat. Mm. So how do you do that in your writing? Oh, sorry. No, you're good. Basically, well, <laughs> sometimes it pays to to read things out loud and and to start to see like, okay, I'm starting to drone on here because I think when you when you read it out loud, it, it's a very different experience, you know, mm -hmm. to, than to just reading it on the page. And I think it's much richer that way. And then if you can't do it, you don't feel comfortable doing it, then have somebody else do it and see how it sounds that way. And that can be jarring and kind of terrifying, but also really good for your writing. And then you can kind of say, okay, well, I need to dial it back and I need to really switch back into 
where are the characters at? Where do they need to be? Can I can I gallivant here anymore? Did I go too far? So I just think that's one helpful tool is just to, to read it out loud. And then also you'll probably find something that you missed editing <laughs> when you're doing okay. that. Seems like inevitable. And then another thing too is is make sure that someone else is reading your work before you mm. hand it off because they'll tell you, you know, this is this is great, but I got really distracted by this. You know, what's what's happening here? So both those things, those tricks are good tricks to have just generally from an editing perspective too. It's it's just, you have to have another eye or several on it. I always have a team of three or four beta readers and then the editor after, after I've taken into account what the beta readers say and alter it or not, then I move it on to the, the editor and get that feedback. And there's always feedback. So, yeah, but that's what I recommend. It's just trying to not get lost in the weeds. How did you find your beta readers, by the way? So one, a couple were family members, a couple were active readers who are voracious readers and they will read any genre. And I think that's important actually, because I like to have cross appeal. Like some of the readers were sci-fi fans, some just really don't read sci-fi. And so I thought, well, if I could entice a non-genre reader to care about this situation, then I've kind of threaded the needle I wanted to be, you know, wanted to accomplish. And so that was my nice little cocktail mixture there. And it worked really well, I thought. And, you know, I, I was presented with questions from the non-genre readers that really made me think and that gave me a perspective of, oh, I didn't think about that. You know, I, I just assumed you would know what I was talking about. And they're no, I have no idea what this means. What do you mean here? You know, so that's, try to be key in that regard. Try to have somebody that, that reads a lot, that likes mm -hmm. to read and does, you know, cause that's a gift to you as a writer is to have somebody read your work at any level of it. It's always a gift and a wonderful thing. And if they can do it at that point, and you can kind of step back and, you know, see if something needs to be changed. It's perfect. Yeah, you definitely have to have to have the ability to not get butt hurt. <laughs> <'Cause, laughs> right. You know, oh, yeah. it's like someone someone comes in and they're just like, yeah, this whole chapter, I don't see how it's con how it connected to anything in the story. And you could love that chapter. But if you really stop, step back and take a look at what that chapter is doing for the plot or even the character, and it's not doing either, then you got to cut it. Yeah, we should cut it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's you can't have to you need to be able to be malleable as a writer and as an editor, right, to a certain extent. But, but it's more rigid for an editor, I think, because you have the rules that you got to go by. Um, but as a writer, you just can't take things too personally. You know, it's some things come down to style and not everybody likes your style. And that's there's nothing you can do about that. And that's that's not doesn't mean you're a bad writer. It's just not their thing. And we can't all like the same things. It'd be pretty. Oh no, Diane. I think her. no. Bum bum. Going up space. <laughs> Hopefully she comes back. <laughs> this is such a good point. It she was a good point. <laughs> um. So while while she's coming back, um, I I completely up. Yeah, she had to drop out. Um. I I completely agree. Like, oh god, now I just distracted myself and I forgot the point. <laughs> oh, this is fun. Um, Lauren, help me <laughs> as we flounder. Um, so, like, okay, so everything that we have been talking about world building, um, you got to take into account you know, your characters, you got to take into account your plot, you know, how, how deep is that plot going, you know, um, to, oh, yeah, okay, she came back. I'm back. <laughs> Had to <laughs> restart. Crazy. Okay. Where were we? Um, you, you were making an excellent point that I was fumbling, trying to half think through. So hopefully you remember where you were. Cause <laughs> well, we were talking Do about you know where she was, Lord. Characters. <laughs> um, oh, dialing back on. Yeah. Too much. And then the and then the beta readers and, and then um, the beta readers. Yes. And oh, the value of a good beta reader and not being butthurt as an author. Right. You just right. can't be too sensitive to that. Yeah. Which is our whole lives. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, 
because you know that's part of what makes you a good writer is that you are sensitive to things and it's it's hard to get criticism on any level but it's also super valuable and what i really like about editors which are a godsend no matter what mm -hmm. editors are my heroes is that i like it when editors guide and don't chide as i like to say so that comes in here for world building or anything else yeah as an editor i always feel a little bit timid or nervous about offering um not always that's pretty strong but offering suggestions for feedback especially if the feedback is like this whole chapter needs to be re rewritten or this whole section <laughs> well. of the book is just not working you know something like delivering the bad news uh but then when i was in the author side of it and i was working with my editor i wanted to hear everything she you know all of the feedback right. she had for me i wanted to hear all of the criticism because i wanted to fix it before it went out to the public right. so the more she could tell me that needed to be changed, the more reassured I felt actually that this book was getting better and better and better and more ready for the public. Exactly. Um, so I was kind of surprised that my reaction as an author was completely the opposite of what I anticipated as the editor. Honestly, well, we appreciate editors. Yeah. Because we, because we are editors and we want to give this feedback. So when we're in our own writing, we're like, please, I know what I may say to myself if I hadn't written this. Tell me the things, all the things. I want all right. of it. That's um, how I feel. So let's see, coming down, how much is too much? Yeah. So I, I'm i really curious about this. We've kind of touched a little bit on it already. Um, but what are some unique ways that you world build? Like you, you've, you've already discussed sort of the, you know, getting into we may have already talked this to death. The, I may need to go to the fashion uh, and the glossary. The, the fashions and but we haven't talked lighting. about her painting yet. The, uh, we talked about we that go. before the show, but we haven't talked about it during oh, the yeah. show yet. Well, we can talk okay, about so that. Let's bring that into yeah. the question. Unique ways to world build. Well, show aside from right. making a menu, <laughs> which I think would be fun um, for the food in your universe or drink, making a menu. Uh, if you can draw it out, that's one way to to world build is to come up with a map or you know fashion or functional items that you would find weaponry you know any sort of spacecraft i also like to draw spacecrafts although other people could do it better than i can so i hire them to do that right so i i feel like let's let's talk about the toys you know in your universe that you're making like what would make a great action figure accessory you know like build that stuff out that's fun right Think of the fun things. Like if you're going into another world, what do you, where do you want? You know, if you want to be transported somewhere, like you think of amusement park rides. Like it makes you feel like you're immersed. And why is that? What you like the movement, or or is it or is it what you're seeing visually? You know. So I like to come at it from an angle of fun and make things more fun. Like what's the space jewelry? You know, like Galadea has this diamethyst you know what's the story behind that well it's actually part of who she is so wow. and then you know I, I like i like to draw things obviously and that kind of that's i grew with the writing and the art kind of grew together and so i designed hundreds and hundreds of space fashions outrageous stuff but i also designed places buildings i have in book four there's a particular building that I actually did an architectural plan of. Um, hmm. It's not a remarkable building, but I wanted to get the sense for what this place looked like and the layout inside. So I could imagine walking down the hallway and into the kitchen or out into the garden or wherever this was taking place and build it out. So there's there's all these different angles you can look at to help build your world, you know. And, hmm. but I like the fun aspect a lot, the food and the accessories yeah. and the weapons and the ships and strange craft you know of any kind i like that and i also like to know what's in the sky mm. you know when you look up at the night sky here we see a certain set of constellations that don't exist anywhere else you know in the same pattern <laughs> as, as quite the same way as they do on earth but on a totally alien world what are you looking up when the sky is clear what do you see you know are there more than one moon you know are there comets or things like that is there much of an atmosphere you know, think of all the different angles and come to it from there. So you can extend or contract it, right? You're going from the micro level of, I want this alien pastry or this berry, and then what's in the sky and what's in the system around it, you know, what other planets are in the system, you know, what other 
space phenomena are close by, is there a singularity close by, how does that affect things? So if there's a disastrous, catastrophic natural event, which is in my story, you know, how is it disrupting transmission and communication in the galaxy? And then that creates problems for your characters who need to get in touch with each other and they can't. So, you know, think of all the things that in your daily life, like if you lost your phone, you know, that you would miss and translate that to something that, you know, what tools, if, if you lost your bow or you lost your ax, or you lost your sword, you lost your powerful jewel, you know, all the fun stuff, build out from, from there if you want to, you know, and establish that. So that, that definitely segues in. I don't know, maybe maybe you'll have just a little bit more, but Patricia Gilliam uh, before had asked, what are some things writers tend to overlook when mm. world building? Um, so if there's anything else within that realm that you can think of as far as like those key things, perhaps that, you know, it's just like that, it, without that, it makes the story or the world lacking. We talked about sensory, you know, developments like when you walk on a surface what does it feel like what is what do things smell like around you what's the lighting like we talked about that but that is pretty important you know that sort of sensory sensation of, of being immersed somewhere you need to know what's underfoot what's overhead and and also you know what does it feel like you know and what are you having to wear to deal with this environment around you? things like that and so little details add up you know and make it more real you know mm -hmm. and to we we tend to also overlook sometimes like you talked about that great scene earlier and how it was an intimate scene and i think sometimes you do need to press pause and let these characters take a moment and just be where they're at and talk mm -hmm. quietly some of the best scenes in shows movies books to me are the scenes in which everybody's just kind of hanging out you know like what's going on when they're hanging out like what's around them and and do you feel relaxed this is before they get thrown into chaos right you know and you know yeah. it because they're all kind of chilled out you're like oh no so but at the same time i think you have to build out those little scenes those little quiet moments and i think some some writers overlook the importance of the quiet moment and what's mm -hmm. happening in that moment and the camaraderie between the characters and their environment in that moment I completely agree with that. That was one of the first lessons I learned when I was um, first getting into writing was I hate, I had too many big moments. It was all big. Everything was big. Everything was duh. And so it never gave the reader or the characters a chance to just breathe process so that they could move forward. Right. Um, so I, I, and I, I see that sometimes in writing is it's like, okay, you need to scale back this and we need to kind of, breathe for a minute <laughs> yeah so and then and it's okay if if you don't you don't want to like heavily handed say you can tell this is never gonna happen again. um yeah. <laughs> it's there was somebody had this great comment about book four this one scene before chaos happens of course and they, they were like it's like a rockwell paint this one little mm -hmm. snapshot and, and everybody's doing all these different things in the picture and i thought i didn't even intend for that but that's exactly what that is and I think that that's actually a really good idea going forward is to, to have a moment or two, not heavy handed, but it's a Rockwell moment where it's capturing this different activity going on in the background. Like they're talking about this back there, you know, because when you when you're in a story and, and there's there's things, there's interactions between everybody, you really feel like that's your family or that's like a, a moment in time that you would go back to. So, What point of view do you use to to bring all of those characters in? Are you working in first person or third person? Um, present tense or past tense? Well, that's a good question. And usually I'm doing third person, you know, mm -hmm. and then there are moments though when someone is thinking, mm -hmm. you know, and that's sort of, especially because there's telepathic stuff going on that kind of becomes a first person oh. situation sometimes. but. And you can tell I italicize those pieces of the text. And so it's just, there's not any fourth wall breaking going on per se, but you almost skate to that line. And so I like to switch that up, but most of the time it's third person and it's, you know, things beyond their control, but you need to know what they're thinking too. I think it's important to, to relate that. Like I, my one, you know, the telepathy thing isn't the only thing because 
there's other people thinking out loud, so to speak, in the story. And I think that helps you kind of understand where they're coming from, to have their perspective there in that scene versus just looking through the window at them, right? So it's a mix in a way, but usually third person and uh, this, but there's sometimes when there's a situation that a character is thinking back on something that happened in mm -hmm. the past, in the recent past, like this just happened like three days ago. And so you sort of switch up the tense a little bit creatively there. That's kind of fun to play with because they're, they've reached a moment where there's a lot of stuff going on with lots of different characters. And then they want to, they're, they're sort of thinking back like, oh my God, this just happened to me and I'm processing it, you know? So that's useful, yeah. switching up the tense a little bit there. So I'm moving kind of from like had, you know, like he had done this a few days ago kind of deal, so. The reflecting. So you're bringing some of that right. reflection kind of in. Yeah, and you um, see the scene, even though they're, they're in the present, they're reflecting back on the scene and then they suddenly have to deal with the present again, just to kind of bring you to what they've been through. Well, other things are going on with the characters. I have a lot of characters, so I need to address, you know, what's been going on with this other set while other things are happening out in the galaxy. Yeah, so and that like, can be uh, kind of so tricky. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. That can be uh -oh. kind of tricky with, um, you know, if you're writing in third person with a limited. Oh, no. oh, oh did you, can you hear us? me? We can see you. Can you see <laughs> us? I see I you. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about all of these. In problems, our world folks. building, these things never happen. So that's something that could be fun to talk about is is glitches. <laughs> I know the technology is not always perfect. Right. Something, something might break. Something should break. If you want it to be believable. Like oh no. <laughs> we need a we need a new actually. Um, Sorry, you were finishing a thought, Lauren, and I'm just <laughs> moving on. Oh, I wasn't sure if you guys could hear me anymore. Oh, yes. Sorry. This has been a, a wonderful show, guys. Sorry about this. this, is a, this is um, a, yeah. So so the question is, with all of these different... Here, I'll bring it back in. I'm coming. I'm back. <laughs> coming. Sorry. Oh, weird. Okay. Okay. There Fine. we go. Yay. Oh, it's okay. It happens. So, it's keystroke. So we were talking about tents and things like that and perspective. Right, yeah, if you have all of these different characters going on and, and some of them are telepathic and some of them are thinking about the past, you're writing in third person, it can be confusing for the reader to follow all of that and you might accidentally, you know, head hop. Right. So how do you keep it clear to the reader like which perspective you're, you're in right now and even though you have multiple characters? And details going on well the telepathy thing uh when that interacts it's it's basically generally it's italicized to stand out it's like mm -hmm. you know at that moment they're not talking out loud that's how i distinguish it and i have some people who switch back and forth you know and so that you can tell when it's italicized they're they're speaking through their thoughts and when it's not they're speaking to other people who don't have the ability or they they can't read their thoughts either because there are some characters that the telepaths can't read and that creates tension there. And and also, it sometimes is, is a relief. You know, like a, the character Ariel can't read Galadea, nobody can. And so she's like, honestly, you're like taking a break. It's nice because she's bombarded by people's thoughts if she allows them. And mm -hmm. the rest of the gal's just there, just as a friend, you know, like as if she didn't, as if Ariel didn't have telepathy. So it's, it's a nice mental break. So I just like to make sure that the dialogue is distinguished that way for one thing. And then, you know, adding in who's talking, you need to kind of keep track of that. You don't want to bounce around between too many people without any dialogue tags for too long, right? Yeah. And that can get really confusing. Yeah. So you don't it's want to overdo it. You don't want to underdo it. It's a nice, nice little mix. You know. So establishing right out of the gate, you know, right. that, um, I'm speaking in my head, it's all italicized. Yeah. And then reactions of other characters, you know, it will play on, you know, how how that's being done. So then later on in the book, you don't have to reiterate, he thought, you know, exactly. telepathically, you know, exactly. it'll just be that visual cue of, right. um, of, of that immersion, which is definitely where you want to get the reader at, right. is where you can kind of do a little bit less of the reminder because you've already, stuck it hard enough that you can just get onto the other juicier bits. Yep, exactly. That's the goal. 
Well, we had a couple questions from the audience. Yeah. Crickets asked, who are some of the writers and stories that inspired you when you were young? Well, I really enjoyed Ray Bradbury's books, in Martian Chronicles, Dandelion Wine, actually, and then some of the short stories, the collected short stories are really haunting. And I read Asimov, you know, and Arthur C. Clarke, those guys. And so they had some effect. I read Dune, and not all of the Dune series, but some. And I liked the ecology of that a lot. And I also am probably the biggest Oz book fan you'll ever meet. And um, L. Frank Baum's 14, 14 original Oz books. And they're so outrageous and crazy and fun that you could mine those for decades and never get to the bottom of them. And it could, it, there's definitely a big influence on my work, even in the sci-fi aspect. And you'll see, especially in book four, there's an obvious couple of nods to Oz. And so I also really liked, in terms of fantasy, I really liked Robin McKinley's Damar books, uh, The Hero in the Crown and the Blue Sword. Yes, me too. And, um, yeah, so those are great. And I also really liked Anna Green Gables and things like that. And having that temperamental, volatile, emotional character like Gala is a lot like that in my stories where she's, she, but in her case, she's very feral at first. She looks like a human, but she isn't. And she needs to fit in with humans. And she acts like basically a, a, a grown brat, you know, and so, a little bit of that going on, a little bit of my fair lady situation with her early on until she can try to figure out how to fit in. And there's always kind of that underlining theme of people trying to fit in. Right. Which everyone kind of feels that way at some point or other in their life right. uh, or for a long points or other in their lives. <laughs> like Forster wants to fit in in a different way. He wants to have purpose. Yes. And he's just, you know, he's, he's in his 40s. He's like, my, my relationship life is a shambles. I, what am I going to do? You know, and then he's starting to open up to this latent ability he didn't know he had. And then it, that kind of gives him a direction to go in, you know. So all this, you want, you want your characters to feel like you feel sometimes. And then you want a better outcome, you know, so you invent it. Or not, unless you're going to kill off somebody's favorite character, which I do too. <laughs> Whoa. I don't hold back. <laughs> dun, know. dun, dun. Yeah. So it's speaking, right. yep, I was just about to pull that one up. Speaking of um, like how you the, just like down to the grit of who your character is, Kitty Kathy, cat hit cat, Kitty Cat hit hip hop. Good lord, which threats conflicts do you feel most comfortable placing in front of your hero? The internal emotional, the external physical, or the philosophical moral? Ooh, I love to do that to all of them. I like to just tear them apart and uh, so the internal I like to have these moments because I love doing all three I love it this is part of my favorite part of writing is putting these people in these problems and some of them are very intimate problems and incredibly uncomfortable like I've had several readers say I I cringed so much in these scenes I, I couldn't handle it I almost had to I couldn't deal with how these characters are interacting. Like, so awkward. I can't believe, you know, it's how I was like, I've lived that, you know, like, and I want you to feel that pain, okay? And so I have that happening a lot, including in book four, just these incredibly excruciating moments where, like, oh, God, no. You know, like, there's like, this why is this happening? Can we just fast forward? It's just forward? so <laughs> awkward, and you just can't stand it. It's kind of like an episode of Frasier, right? And which kind of influenced that a little bit, but I, I've been through so many terrible things <laughs> uh, relationship wise, like that I just so awkward. I used to be incredibly awkward socially. And so I kind of like to throw that back in there. Like I'm better than I was, but you know, sometimes, you know, and so I, I like that, but I also like the external, like incredibly dangerous situation where you're being attacked by another ship or a creature or, you know, some sort of strange entity that's gonna take over your mind, you know? So I love that too. And then the moral aspect is something to dig in in which the, the characters sometimes will ask of themselves, you know, why am I here and what can I do? You know, and, and we all ask that, right? Every day we're like, why am I here? And, and what's my purpose? What's my direction? And then sometimes if, if, you, if you wallow in it too much, you know, it's, it's hard, so. I like to have that happen to all the heroes in my books, you know, to put them in these situations that are intimate between 
you know, a, a scene with two characters or where they're being attacked and how they're going to rally and help each other, like action scenes, quiet scenes, and then questioning scenes of what's my place in this universe. You know? mm -hmm. I think it's, that's, that literally is like, that is my most favorite aspect of all of this is putting those characters really through it. Do you yeah. intentionally resolve them at the end, like figure out how to resolve these conflicts at the end? Or do you find that as your characters work their way through the plot, like it just kind of naturally all comes together in the end? Well, it's a mix of both. Some of them have very concrete ends of their arcs. And, you know, I like to wrap that up. And others, I leave it a little bit hanging where you don't really know if they really figured it out. Uh, and then that, you know, it's okay to leave some questions unanswered as long as it doesn't become too much of a mystery box, right? Lost. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> love the show, but, you know, it's kind of some stuff was left hanging. But anyway, I... I do feel like it's it's good to if there's a definite arc you want to wrap it up, and but if there's an ongoing hint that this is just something that they will be continuously dealing with, I think that's important too because that's how it is in real life. Sometimes we have problems that they're never going to quite go away. They just have to learn to cope with. Hmm. You know, like for me, anxiety is a major thing, and so I realize and I've come become comfortable with the fact that I'm always going to have some level of anxiety, no matter how ridiculous it is, you know, to everybody else. It's like, that's part of who I am. And so I like to have that in my characters too, where you just have to accept that they're, they have this challenge and that, you know, maybe their approaches to things are different because of the challenge and maybe that never fully resolves, but it's part of who they are. I like that. So overall, you know, when, when you're, when you're out there beginning building your world, you know, think about the scope, you know, think about the scope of what your plot and how that's going to affect your characters. You know, do you need a big, huge, grandiose, you know, multi world, multi universe thing, or, or is it, is it good just in one little town or one little lake cabin? Um, and don't forget, don't forget the sensory, you know, sight, sound, taste, smell, all those delicious things, you know, get that in there. Unique character traits, even that's part of world building. And how is that going to affect, you know, points of the plot or different characters and how they're interacting? Um, all of this is delicious. All of this is gold. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, Thanks for having I mean, me. We could totally keep talking about this. But we don't want to keep, we won't keep you too long. <laughs> this has um, been so, great. Thank you so much. And Thank we're... You can all of our viewers, listeners later on on the pod bean side find you and your work? So I'm at jdianedotson.com and that's the two ends. But I think if you misspell it, it should still get you there. <laughs> I recommend that when you make it get a domain name, put in the misspelling. And then so I'm on social media, jdianedotson across the board at Twitter and Instagram. For Facebook, it's jdianedotsonwriter. So look for me everywhere. I'm out there. I'm on LinkedIn, TikTok, all the good, all those fun TikTok. things. TikTok, wow. Okay. I have a Robbie the Robot demonstration toy just like behind me on TikTok right now. If you want to see him nice. in action. So yeah, find me out there. I, I'm pretty active on social media and I love meeting new people. So, and has okay. something exciting coming up too for your readers? Oh, on April 1, No Fooling is the cover reveal for the fourth and final book of the Questrazon saga and it is gorgeous it's going to happen april 1 my newsletter subscribers get to see it before anybody else so if you want to subscribe go to my website there's a little thing at the bottom and i usually email once a week at most and sometimes longer but never more than once a week unless something huge is happening but in this case i'm looking really forward to debuting that beautiful cover and to wrapping this story up it's a big book it's the biggest one and there's worlds building and lots of intimacy and it's steamy and Ooh. scary and fun and heartwarming and it's got it all. So book four really, you know, I can't wait for you to read it. So find me out there in In the Stars at Astra. Alrighty. Well, thank you everyone in the live chat for joining us here thank on you. today's Writer's Journey. Um, be sure you're dinging that bell, hit the little subscribe button, you know, the little thumbs up thingy and also you find us over in facebook at keystroke medium um don't forget keystroke coffee if you're 
a, a writer out there and you're just like so much world building, can't stay awake, you know, get your keystroke coffee at keystrokemedium.com, wake butt up, get back to writing. Alrighty, All right. for Lauren Moore, I am Kayleen Williams. We'll be seeing you next week for more reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey.